Hello, everybody. Now I try again uh, to give this talk after the little tef technical difficulties which I faced uh, before. I hope that it works now. So thanks again for uh, Bumedin uh, for organizing this session on reservoir computing and uh, dynamical systems. Uh, I'm very happy to contribute to it and I'm happy to contribute a point of view which might be unusual from the point of view of reservoir computing. First, it is unusual because it is a point of view with respect to continuous time dynamical systems and not as usual discrete time dynamical systems. But second, it is also a point of view which takes um, uh, ideas and concepts from a field which is called rough analysis, rough path theory, and uh, combines them uh, with some ideas from uh, compressed sensing in order to construct uh, reservoirs uh, on which we can represent uh, given dynamical systems and uh, also to prove why this actually has to work. But let me start uh, 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 right at the beginning by introducing some uh, notation and then uh, 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 developing the theoretical concepts. Let me just uh, start here. As I said, it is uh, the goal of the talk to present a paradigm of reservoir computing and to connect it to uh, recurrent neural networks and signature representations. Recurrent neural networks is very standard for reservoir computing. Signature, signature representations is less standard. Then we apply some random projection techniques to construct uh, true reservoirs and prove uh, related generalization results. And we highlight at the end at some aspects of uh, randomness in general uh, learning procedures and on the explanations giving to uh, randomness appearing in learning procedures via signature techniques, random projections, and time series techniques. It's important to mention that this is work with uh, Christa Cruciero, Lukas Gromon, Ludmila Grigorieva, Martin Larsen, and Juan Pablo Ortega. And I will point out where uh, and which works uh, I'm referring to in this talk. So, as I said already before, we take here a continuous time perspective. So we consider continuous time, non-autonomous ordinary differential equations as models for uh, recurrent neural networks. And let me first introduce or fix the notation. So we have the following uh, bit given. We have a state space E. This could be Rn or a compact manifold as in the talk of Allen. Uh, initial value is uh, little y and the y zero at time zero or at the time s wherever you start this non-autonomous system is um, just uh, um, and in, in just little y. Then we have a so-called control. The control is uh, uh, for instance, C1 curve, but could also be a rough path, a total variation uh, a curve, a Stratonovich Brownian motion, and we have some vector fields VI, these are vector fields on the state space, and we have the following differential equation. The derivative of Y with respect to time is a weighted linear sum of directions vi, these are the vector fields, weighted by the derivatives of the controls. This is called the controlled ordinary differential equation. U is called the control and the U enters the solution or the, the, the movement of this uh, dynamical system by uh, putting weight on the different vector fields. 
And one can see the solution of this controlled ordinary differential equation depending on two bits. One bit is the initial value, y, where it starts, and the other bit is the control, what you feed into the system in order to uh, reach certain targets. In the work with uh, Martin Larson, who is now at Carnegie Mellon Pittsburgh, and Krista Kukiero from Vienna, we have been analyzing the point of view that for to be trained controls, we are interested in a map from little y to capital Y, and we consider that as a model, as a metaphor for feed-forward neural networks. Feed-forward neural networks, and we were interested in the minimal amount of training we have to do for such feed-forward neural networks, such that we can uh, solve uh, interpolation tasks on uh, uh, arbitrary amount of points given. And we could prove that if the vector fields have certain random features, generic random features, then this is actually possible without training the vector fields, just by training the uh, controls. This is what we meant by minimal amount uh, of training effort. But this is not the point of view of today's talk. Today's talk is taking uh, the other input slot and fixing the Y. So we fix the Y now, and the other input slot is the U. U is the control, and we are considering the map from the control to the solution trajectory. So we have a control, and this is mapped to a solution trajectory. And we would like to understand the nature of this map and uh, possible representations of this map. Well, let's uh, get a little bit more formal here. W is some um, readout additionally, but this is not a trained readout. This is just a, a projection. You can say a projection of the solution of this non-autonomous system. If we have a non-autonomous system, usually we write it as an evolution, not as a flow. So we start at S with Y, go to time T, and we are interested on the nature of the map from the control to this output. This is an input output system and uh, can be taken as a continuous time model metaphor for recurrent neural networks or LSTMs. Yeah, and this can of course be used for time series uh, analysis, predictions, uh, and so on. So we'd like to understand the nature of such uh, of this map in order to find representations of this map or approximation structures for this map. And of course, the, 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 the paradigm of reservoir computing would say you have this map from U to the output, capital Y. And reservoir computing says map U to another output, an intermediate output. This is the reservoir. And on the reservoir, it suffices to make a regression in order to learn in an exhaustive and uh, impressive way the dynamics of this input-output system. So actually, in terms of uh, mathematical uh, language, we split the input-output map, which you would like to learn, into a generic part, which is of generalized recurrent neural network type, the reservoir, and which is not trained, and a readout part, which is trained. And often the readout is chosen linear. This is what we are going or we are heading for. And the reservoir has random features. And it's usually a very tractable dynamical system. Just one slide on uh, aspects of reservoir computing, which of course you all know. So uh, reservoirs are often realized uh, physically and therefore ultra fast evaluations are possible. Of course, a, a computer is also a physical realization with uh, uh, electromagnetic features, but there are other physical realizations where optical uh, effects are used and there might also be biological realizations when you think a little bit about the uh, talk of uh, Juan Pablo and what he was alluding to. And only the readout W is trained. And uh, one can learn now the dynamic phenomenon if you know the W without knowing the specific, specific characteristics, uh, VI of this um, dynamical system. And as is well known uh, in the field of reservoir computing, this works unreasonably well with uh, generalization tasks. 
Okay, so let us analyze that a little bit from the point of view of uh, controlled ordinary differential equations. We have such a controlled ordinary differential equation and we would like to understand whether we can construct abstractly a reservoir. And there's an old technique, uh, non-commutative Taylor expansion, where you take your input control, which as we said before, could be finite variation continuous, a rough path or a Sratonovich Brownian motion, and we would like to understand what is the dependence of the output on this input. As I was saying, my lectures on stochastic analysis, this is a complicated nonlinear map, and one can prove that in general this map is in best case um, measurable, not more. Therefore, one has to understand very precisely uh, the structure of that map in order to come up with uh, regression features, which are by themselves, of course, of a very high regularity. So notation, the following, I take a vector field, which is here, uh, imagine you have some linear structure on E so that the tangent bundle is equal to the space itself. We have a smooth vector field, we have a test function, and we consider vector fields actually as first order differential operators. This is very easy to understand. Apply the vector field to a test function by just taking the direction a derivative at a certain point in the direction of the vector field at this point. Yeah. So this is the notation V, the vector field applied to F, the test function, by just taking direction derivative. Now one can easily prove by just inserting the defining equation into itself, it's, a, it's an iteration argument that actually a test function applied to the solution of this dynamical system can be written as the following finite sum. You have parts which only depend on the vector field and not on the control u, and you have parts which only depend on the control and not on the uh, uh, on the vector fields V, and actually the split is linear. So when you collect a whole vector of iterated integrals, a big, huge vector of iterated integrals, and you think of a space of iterated integrals, then you have a linear map which just comes with these coefficients and the action of a test function on this solution path is just applying the linear map, of course, depending on the test function and on the characteristics on the big vector of iterated integrals. This is a remainder term, one can write it down. This has been done by many people, just pars pro toto mentioning Kuatsai Chen, Gerabi Rus, and of course, Terry Lyons, who took this expansion as a starting point of rough path theory or how, is it, how it is now called uh, rough analysis. And yeah, um, let me at this point make a little detour. So we know that uh, actually we are able to write the action of a test function on the solution of this dynamical system with the characteristics vi, we are able to write it as something which depends only on the vi's and on the test function. This is the readout. This has to be learned. This is specific for the dynamical system and something which depends only on the controls. So this has to do with the nature of the control, not of the dynamical system. The question is, does this set of uh, iterated integrals have anything additional which we uh, possibly would like to understand and which helps us to formulate uh, the theory in a better way. And this is actually the case when you think of the vector of all iterated integrals you quickly realize that actually this vector satisfies a certain differential equation, actually a linear differential equation on an infinite dimensional space. You can immediately, immediately imagine that if you take an iterated integral of order k, so e coordinate e1 and coordinate e2 up to ek is uh, in an iterated way uh, calculated. If you take the derivative with respect to time, you end up with a lower iterated integral. So you might have a sort of um, um, 
nilpotent structure here, which you could uh, imagine. Well, and this can be formalized. So we consider the free algebra of former power series, actually series of former series generated by D non-commutative determinants. If you feel uncomfortable with indeterminants, which are non-commutative in an abstract algebraic sense, just uh, take, imagine here matrices, matrices where you don't know whether they commute or not. So this is uh, former series in those uh, non-commutative indeterminates. And um, they can be written in the following way. Apparently these uh, non-commutative uh, former series, they have an algebra structure, but just multiplying as you would multiply monomers uh, of uh, non-commuting matrices and adding as you would add monomers of non-commuting matrices and then extending everything to the to this algebra of former series. So this is actually a vector space. You can make as a topology in it, a locally convex topology. And this vector space um, is, a, is a sequence space, but the sequence space has a particular algebraic structure due to this uh, former power series uh, idea uh, put upon it. It's actually a Hopf algebra which I will further allude to in a couple of minutes. I just want to mention it here because I'm also sitting in the building where Heinz Hopf was working uh, many years ago since he was one of the members of the math department here at ETH. So in this algebra, of course, we have vector fields. The vector fields are multiplication from the right with um, the generators. These are D vector fields. So if I take an element A of the algebra, I can multiply it with any other element of the algebra and in particular so with one of those indeterminates. And if I multiply from the right, this gives me a linear vector field on the algebra. And voila, this is what we consider. And then we consider the following ordinary linear differential equation on the algebra signature equation. This is a controlled differential equation. The state space is not the algebra, it's infinite dimensional, but it doesn't matter. One can formulate that very well, uh, just coordinate uh, by coordinate. And then you are solving it. The solution is no surprise given by the power series where at each level you are just having the iterated integrals of order i1 up to ik associated to the product of ei1 up to eik. And this infinite power series after a moment's reflection is the solution of the previous equation number one. What is more fascinating and what has to do with the Hopf algebra structure is that actually signature, if I started at one this algebra has a one, this is the empty product. If I start signature at one, actually signature takes values in a subspace. It does not uh, fill the whole space, it takes value in a subspace. So filling the space in the sense that uh, uh, if you take a particular control, you could imagine that you could reach every point in space by just uh, um, uh, adapting the control accordingly, but actually it's not the case. You can only reach every point in this subspace, capital G, which is additionally a Lie group and which has additionally the following very funny property. If you take linear maps on the algebra and restrict those linear maps on the group G where the signature lives, where it takes uh, values. And if you multiply two such linear maps, then actually this multiplication, which is by itself obviously not the linear map on the whole algebra, is the restriction of a linear map on the group. So somehow the restriction of linear maps on the group actually form an algebra and are therefore in a to be specified sense dense in continuous functions. So that's the Hopf algebra essence of this uh, uh, theory and something uh, very important and fascinating to know. 
in other words, in terms of signature, this just means if I multiply signature of the curve u uh, of a certain level i1 up to ik and i multiply it with j1 up to jl then i can write that as a linear combination of signatures of other signatures in uh, a very abstract way of thinking about the leibniz rule so in that sense, signature is not only a very good way how to represent a dynamical system, it is also a dynamical system itself. In that sense, you would say signature qualifies by all means as a reservoir in the sense that if I have a test function applied to a specified dynamical system, I can find a regression map W and let's say signature up to order M yeah, signature up to order M, such that um, um, the remainder term is small in such a typically Taylor sense, and the uh, Signature term only depends on the control, whereas the W only depends on the specific characteristics. This is like a reservoir. So you can construct here reservoirs of signature type, which are able to represent up to a certain order of accuracy in time, in running time, any dynamical system. At this point, satisfying, but from the point of view of reservoir computing, of course, not satisfying because signature is a dynamical system. Signature is something on which you can run regressions, but signature is neither low dimensional nor does it have random features. It's a very well specified dynamical system and it is potentially infinite dimensional. So as I write it here, this explains that any solution can be uh, represented up to a linear readout by a universal reservoir named the signature. This has of course been used in the, in the, in the working group of uh, Terry Lyons, Howard Overhouse and many others in Oxford or JP Morgan when you look at the recent work, non-parametric pricing and hatching of exotic derivatives by Terry, Sina and Imanol. But in contrast to reservoir computing, as I pointed out, signature is very high dimensional and a precisely defined non-random object. And the question is, can we approximate signature by a lower dimensional random object, which has similar properties to signature, but this lower dimensional object has on the one hand random features and on the other hand is, as it should be for reservoir computing, analytically um, tractable. So one can easily deal with it analytically. Well, and in order to do that, we apply the famous Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma. So uh, this is the following thing. You have an endpoint set, Q, in a scalar product space. And you ask the following question, can you write a map of F on the scalar product space H, which is going to a lower dimension, typically lower dimension R, K, such that the distances are only distorted up to a factor one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon. So this is almost isometric on Q. Not everywhere, but on Q. Everywhere it cannot be because it goes to a lower dimensional space and you might have some uh, directions which are just, with some patch rate, just not uh, even uh, injective. Okay. And the fascinating thing is not only can we find a lower dimensional space of a dimension which is logarithmic in the number of points. Also, it is possible to construct with a high probability such maps. So we can find lower dimensional spaces r to the power k, where the number of uh, the dimension goes with the logarithm of the number of points in q. And additionally, we have a probabilistic method how to construct such maps f. Actually, they are random matrices appropriately scaled, and uh, this is actually what we're going to apply. 
And the proof is surprisingly simple of this result, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, now. Yeah. Just to rephrase the statement for you that you see how fascinating it is, it means in terms of k, this low dimension, that in a k-dimensional space, you can find e to the power k almost orthogonal vectors, which is usually not how we think of high dimensional space. Okay, now we take the, such a johnson lindenstrauss projection. Uh, we take an endpoint set Q, and the endpoint set you can imagine uh, certain parts of the signature curve, which uh, distances we'd like to preserve. And we denote by random signature the smooth evolution of the following dynamical system, which now runs in Rk, so in this low dimensional space. We take Z, this is an element of the low dimensional space, embedded by the adjoint into the high dimensional algebra, project, multiply this by Ei, this is the vector field on the high dimensional algebra, and project the result down. This gives a control differential equation on the low dimensional space. And if n is large enough, the randomized signature actually compresses the information of signature in a very good way. This is what we um, what we um, can prove in this uh, statement. So actually, if n is large enough, and therefore the k is large enough, such a random projection compresses sufficiently many features of the high dimensional object such that the set is getting s or almost as expressive as signature itself. And additionally, when you look at this map f f star, EI, and this is applied to some vector in RK, you see that this is, uh, of course, this is a linear map. And this linear map has, when you look at it from an asymptotic point of view, features of a random matrix with normally distributed independent entries. This is, of course, only an asymptotic result following by Martingale uh, central limit arguments. But it also shows that this dynamical system here is a dynamical system which you can, without knowing signature, and even without knowing particular features of the dynamics generating signature, just construct by itself by just sampling here a random matrix and working with it. Actually, in reality, this looks a tiny little bit different, but the difference is uh, small and there are reasons for it. And uh, I'm, I do not have time to, to uh, elaborate on those reasons. But consider one, just to show you the, the, the algorithm now, consider now an unknown dynamical system for you. Unknown means you know the control, but you don't know the VIs. And you would like to know the VIs. Uh, you don't know the characteristics. And typically the y's are so high dimensional. I will show you an example then later on. And <clears throat> then you can find an activation function, random matrices AI, random shifts beta I, such that you obtain on a moderately dimensional uh, space, actually it should be a K here, this would be better, but let's um, for a moment let's just call it M. Um, you can solve here this equation, which reminds a, a random recurrent neural network if you discretize it. This is a reservoir. This has nothing to do with the dynamics which you want to learn. And the statement is, as a corollary of what we have been proved before, that this random dynamical system actually can be used as a regression basis for the particular controlled ordinary differential equation which we have, which we are given at the beginning, up to a linear readout which we have to learn. Yeah. Um, there's an alternative perspective on this phenomenon which um, um, could also be seen from the point of view of representation theory. 
by just saying, okay, I have my abstract algebra of non-commutative uh, form of series in D non-commutative variables and just Is the same amount of information. And therefore, um, by just collecting all possible functions on the manifold and evaluating the solution of this, uh, of this equation uh, here on the manifold, we just have a representation which is equally expressive as symmetry. And this is a representation theoretic point of view by just saying, you can find a system such that the vector fields maximally do not commute, which you can realize by taking systems where actually um, um, random matrices appear. And then evaluating the solution of this ordinary differential equation with some nonlinear functions gives you uh, an object which is more and more approximating the features of symmetry itself. Yeah. Let's take an example which you could easily imagine is fascinating from the point of view of mathematical finance. The dynamics of uh, S&P 500. S&P 500 are 500 uh, major stocks and let's in neglect interest rates here for a moment which under mild assumptions can be seen to follow uh, Ito diffusion. The mild assumptions are Markovianity on this 500 dimensional price state space and uh, continuous trajectories. Under those mild assumptions, you will have such a structure and you will additionally also have an equivalent measure change such that Y is a local marking that this is the absence of arbitrage. You do not believe in arbitrarily large uh, gains of investments uh, in such a, in such a market. Yeah. Now you imagine that you observe one trajectory of this uh, of this uh, process as it is in reality. You just go you have Yahoo Finance and you can download one uh, trajectory of this of this uh, price process. And then you can do the following thing out of this one trajectory by just learning uh, the, the realized uh, covariance, you can reconstruct from Y the MIs. So these are actually the Brownian motions together with the market price of risk, which exists due to the absence of arbitrage. This you can uh, up to some orthogonal transformations, which does not really matter. This you can do in a pathwise way, or at least uh, up to high accuracy, depending on how, how high frequently you observe the price. And then you would like to learn the VIs, so the vector fields. And in order to do that, you do what you do in reservoir computing always. You take the MIs, you feed them into a reservoir of a moderate dimension, and you just run a regression on the path of the reservoir in order to learn the path Y. And actually this works in finance very well in order to get uh, competitive um, prediction um, um, uh, models. So what you can predict with those models are conditional laws of Y given the information up to time T for some uh, lag into the future. 
and uh, that's a reservoir computing way how to calibrate a nonlinear time series model by actually just learning a regression uh, matrix. Of course, this does not mean that we are able to learn the, the drift here efficiently. This would, of course, not be possible. But what we are able is conditional laws on given the market price of risk of uh, Y and the conditional laws have somehow the correct size because what we have learned actually is the conditional um, uh, dynamics um, given the MIs. So given the market price of risk and the, the market Brownian motions. Okay, so at this point I stop and I just uh, refer to, uh, to the following references. There's a uh, uh, recently submitted and uh, appearing in the next day's archive preprint on this uh, randomized signature, at least in the discrete time version, uh, by Krista Kukiero, Lukas Gono, Ludmila Grigorieva, and Juan Pablo and myself. There's this work which I mentioned uh, shortly where we try to explain expressiveness through randomness in this uh, controlled neural ordinary differential equation setting. And of course, one of the seminal papers is the work by Terry Lyons, rough path signatures and the modeling of functions on streams, a beautiful work explaining the use of signature uh, in uh, machine learning for different types of uh, tasks. Thank you very much for your attention.